evening to you all. I'm Lisa Pingre, and on behalf of the Pune International Center and the Symbiosis International University, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you to the fourth lecture in the Dilip Padgaukar Memorial Lecture Series, which is jointly organized by these two organizations. It is four years today since Dr. Padgaukar left us, um, but he's cast behind this immense shadow that continues to inspire and to guide us. Uh, Dr. Padgaukar was one of those larger than life personalities that will continue to uh, stay tangible across time uh, with his enormous lifetime of work, his irrefutable charm uh, and his varied passions. He was a man of varied passions and uh, interests, uh, current affairs being the most obvious, but also ranging from art to music. He had an incredible singing voice and going up to uh, food and wine. He, uh, with his charm, he befriended heads of state um, with as much ease as he did the local kebabwala, the latter possibly with a great more enthusiasm. Um, and he, much like uh, Henry Higgins, treated both with equal regard. Uh, Dr. Pargaukar was the chairperson of the programs committee at the Pune International Center, and he was a guiding force and a mentor, even in the formation of the Pune International uh, Committee. And he worked zealously to uh, ensure that we had the highest uh, uh, form of events and speakers uh, for the Pune International Center. Uh, the the, the, the Deep Pargaukar Memorial Lecture Series is jointly organized by the Symbiosis International University and uh, the Pune International Center to commemorate the extraordinary life of Dr. Dilip Pargaukar and invite eminent journalists to this platform. We are very honored to have with us here today, Mr. Karan Thapar for the fourth uh, this lecture. I'd uh, now like to request Dr. Raghunath Mashelkar, renowned scientist, innovation man, and also president of the Pune International Center to please address us. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Professor S.B. Muzumdar, our most uh, beloved, revered Dada, as we call him, Dr. Vijay Kelkar, Dr. Vidya Yerodekar, our most uh, distinguished speaker of the day, the one and only Sri Karan Thapar, Latika Padgaukar, members uh, of uh, uh, the Padgaukar family, friends and admirers of Dilip Padgaukar, members of PIC, ladies and gentlemen. I want to extend a very warm welcome to you to this uh, fourth Dilip Padgaukar Memorial Oration. i like to begin by paying our homage to the memory of Dr. Dilip Padgaukar. Although Dilip left us four years ago to this day, it is hard to believe that Dilip is no more. Although he is no more, yet he is everywhere. So strong was his imprint on our PIC, our Pune, our society, our nation. Dilip has been decorated with several adjectives, too numerous to count man of culture and intellect, erudite, classy, liberal, secular, fair-minded, and you can go on and on and on. Lisa, you added uh, some parts of his personality. So multifaceted he was, it is incredible that a single individual would be so multifaceted. To me though, he was all this and much, much more especially in terms of what we are missing today. What we are missing today. Dilip was a liberal to the core, preaching us the values of tolerance, mutual respect for contrarian values, something that we desperately needed today. Dilip spoke passionately, eloquently, and tirelessly against communalism, something we badly need today. Dilip set some iconic standards in journalism and use of media, something again that is missing today, with as some say, news becoming noise and some media channels assuming the role of kangaroo courts, a phrase that is not mine that I heard last week when I was hearing a panel discussion 
in Tata Literature Live 2020. Dilip was courage and confidence personified. He had the guts to say when he was the Times of India editor that he had the second most important job in the country after the prime minister. He was the founder, the leading light of Pune International Center. And I remember his intense discussions with Dr. Vijayakar and myself when we were laying the foundations of PIC as a Vichar Manthan Kendra. Vichar Manthan Kendra recapturing almost 100 years later the magic of 1920s, Pune of 1920s, with the thought leaders like uh, Tilat, Agarkar, Gokhale, Ranade, and so on. He always used to remind us that Pune International Center is actually the international center in Pune. Earlier in February this year, Pune International Center on the east of Ministry of External Affairs hosted the Asian Economic Dialogue with 40 plus most distinguished thought leaders from Asia, from Europe, from American countries. It went so well that some participants said that it would become the divorce of Asia. Well, we are having the second uh, Asian Economic uh, Dialogue on 27 and 28 February in 2021, and we'll certainly try to rise to these expectations. Then there is our series on Ambassador Speaks. We had the French ambassador followed by the Korean ambassador just uh, four weeks ago, and then two weeks ago, telling us about the nuances of global geopolitical dynamics and India's possible place in the context of the rapid reset of the world today. I wish so much that Dilip was there today to see the emergence of PIC as international center in Pune, which was his dream. I'm very happy to welcome Mr. Karan Thapar today as the fourth Dilip Pargaukar Memorial Lecturer following our previous distinguished speakers, Shekhar Gupta, Radip Sardesai, and P. Sainath. Mr. Thapar, I've never had the privilege of meeting you personally, but I'm a member of your fan club. In fact, I'm your ardent fan. I've heard you and admired you over the years. You are an epitome of courage and ethics in journalism. Your hyper-combative political interviews were so refreshing when they came, when they began. It is the deference to the power of the norm and you broke it. I've heard and read your devil's advocate, the last word, face to face, to the point, nothing but the truth, and learn so much from it. On behalf of Pune International Center, and also Symbiosis International University, I extend the warmest welcome to you, Mr. Thapa. Again, thank you for doing us this privilege. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Mashilkar. Um, and now a formal introduction to our guest speaker, Mr. Karan Thapar. Mr. Thapar, journalist and news presenter at The Wire, is also associated with CNN, IBN, and has hosted The Devil's Advocate and The Last Word. With India Today, he hosted the shows To the Point and Nothing But the Truth, and is doing an exclusive series of interviews with The Wire on his show Access Journalism. He began his career with The Times in Lagos, Nigeria, and later worked as their lead writer on the Indian subcontinent. He joined London Weekend Television in the UK, where he worked for the next 11 years. After moving to India, he worked with the Hindustan Times and United Television before setting up his own production house, Infotainment Television, which makes programs for, amongst others, BBC, Doordarshan, and Channel News Asia. He is currently the president of Infotainment Television. Mr. Thapar is noted for his aggressive interviews with leading politicians and celebrities. A few of his shows, which have been much watched, are Eyewitness, Tonight at 10, In Focus with Karan, Line of Fire, War of Words, Devil's Advocate, and The Last Word. In April 2014, Mr. Thapar quit CNN IBN to join India Today, where he hosted the show titled To the Point and Nothing But the Truth. He also writes for the Indian Express, a leading Indian daily as a columnist. Mr. Thapar is the recipient of several awards, which include the Onida Pinnacle Award for Best Current Affairs Presenter for the program, The Chat Show, 
both the awards in the current affairs category of the Asian Television Awards. He was the first person to win both awards. The best current affairs program for an interview with Pakistan's foreign minister, Khurshid Kasuri. The second award for the best current affairs presenter for his popular long running BBC series, Face to Face. The best current affairs presenter award for his interview with Ram Jake Malani and Devil's Advocate. His show, Devil's Advocate, was conferred Best News Current Affairs Show by News Television Awards, and Karan Thapar was presented the award for News Interviewer of the Year at Indian News Broadcasting Awards. These are just some of his varied, varied awards. He also has several books to his credit, Face to Face India, Conversations with Karan Thapar, Sunday Sentiments, Wisdom Tree, More Salt Than Pepper, Dropping Anchor with Karan Thapar, Devil's Advocate, The Untold Story, As I Like It, Wisdom Tree. It is my honor and privilege to invite Mr. Karan Thapar to deliver his talk, A Critique of Indian Television. Mr. Thapar, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for those very warm, generous words. I'm truly flattered. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a particular pleasure and honor to be invited to deliver this year's Dilip Dankar Memorial Lecture. However, I must admit, I seriously question whether I qualify for this distinction. The journalists are questioners, not thinkers. And I know from experience how difficult to answer. So I wonder what Dilip would have made of your choice. Now, I grew up in an era when the Times of India was the paper everyone read. Dilip may have joked when he said its editorship was the second most important job in the country, but when he held that office, his voice was definitely one of the most carefully heard in the country. The morning after the Babri Masjid fell, Narsimha Rao gave only two interviews. The first was to Dilip, and not surprisingly, it made banner headlines, not just in his paper, but in every single paper in the country. The other interview was to me, and it paled in comparison. Yet in those early days, long before private sector television, when current affairs was consigned to monthly VHS video magazines, the leap went out of his way to encourage people like me. He was always willing to appear on our programs and lend dignity and gravitas to what otherwise were amateur and even Jed June productions. His presence lifted them and gave us credibility. So I would like to believe that what I'm going to say today would meet with the Leap's approval. Now, I'm not sure what the Leap would have made of Indian television news and the role that it has come to play in our lives today. But I know that he would have had a lot to say about it. 20 years ago, television was a very different animal to the beast it has become. But I instinctively feel the leap would have shared the questions and issues I wish to raise. And even if he did not agree with the answers I plan to offer, I think he would have listened attentively. It is in that spirit that I approach the subject I've chosen for this evening, a critique of television news. Just over two decades ago, TV news was a government monopoly. We were all captive audiences of Doordarshan. Today, there are nearly 400 dedicated news channels, while several others that have daily news bulletins in their schedule. And I haven't included BBC, CNN, Al Jazeera, Channel News Asia in this reckoning. They would be there regardless of the Indian news miracle. As a result, it's not an exaggeration to claim that news on television is a popular program. Even if the viewership at any one time does not suggest that, two other factors clearly do the enthusiasm of broadcasters for news and the willingness of advertisers to support it. One consequence of this is that we are as a nation better informed 
or at least we have the potential to be. I accept that it all depends on what you watch. But the very profusion of news and its easy accessibility raise questions we would not have asked before. Some of these questions might seem heretical coming from a television news producer. Others point towards debates and solutions the West has encountered, but which we in India have yet to experience. But in either case, they are questions that need to be asked. Today, I want to raise some of them and suggest hesitant answers. Let me start by asking, what sort of news do we get from television? It's pretty much immediate. We no longer have to wait for tomorrow's papers to find out what's happened today. Television news channels can tell you within a minute. Some boast of even doing so faster. Their news can be visual and it is usually highly illustrative. Television shows rather than describes. You feel as if you are witnessing for yourself. And although I do not want to exaggerate, in that sense, television news can be participatory. But television news has two important limitations. And beyond that, in, it has an inherent tendency to sensationalize. Let's tackle the latter first. The screen shows only what the camera films. In turn, the camera films only what the cameraman focuses upon. This is not merely a question of subjective choice, although it is certainly that as well. It is also a technical matter. The camera will film the visual it focuses on, excluding whatever is on either side of it. Thus, a succession of close-ups of a fire, or of dead bodies, or of fallen trees could suggest an enormous blaze, or a massacre, or severe cyclonic destruction. That may be the case, but it's also possible that it may not. Yet in either event, the mind of the viewer will leap to this conclusion. The danger is it could be the wrong one. This is what I call television's inherent tendency to sensationalize. This is also why the statement, it has to be true because I saw it on the box, is actually misleading, or at least it's based upon a fallacious understanding of television. But this problem is easily taken care of, either by pulling out and showing wide shots that put events in perspective, or by wisely written commentary. The only thing is, when journalists are up against tight deadlines, which by the way, is more often than not the case, such balancing is unfortunately frequently squeezed out. The two limitations of television news are unfortunately more difficult to tackle. And in India, at least, I have seen so far very little attempt to tackle them. At times, there is even very little acknowledgement of them. The first limitation is that TV has problems handling what it cannot show. An anchor's head talking is not easy to follow because oral information, A-U-R-A-L, not O-R-A-L, is the most difficult to comprehend, particularly when it is detailed. And graphics or photographs honestly do not always help. This is why television news bulletins occasionally ignore what they cannot film. In a Western democracy where the reach of TV cameras is enormous, this has minimal impact. In India, where the country is enormous and the reach of TV cameras is a lot less, the impact is considerably greater. This is why there is so much more news in the papers than there is on television. Until social media came to our rescue, we could hear or read about lynchings, but we never saw them. Not so long ago, I'm sure many of you will remember, 
when the ABVP would ban jeans in Lucknow colleges, it would be an item in a newspaper, but rarely a story on television. And the answer is simple, because there was nothing to show. More importantly, this is also why the budget is so boring on television. First, it's just a speech. But then there's the question, what is the speech about? That, in a sense, is an even bigger problem. What it's about is not the price of commodities, not even the tax on the price of commodities, but the change in the tax on the price of commodities, and sometimes the percentage change in that tax. None of that is easy to visualize, so instead we are shown potatoes and tomatoes. No wonder those who follow the budget on screen usually doze off. The second limitation of television news, I would say, is more serious. It has to quote a face, sorry, to quote a phrase made famous in Britain by John Burt, a former director general of the BBC in the 1970s, TV has what he called a bias against understanding. Let me explain, and to do so, I deliberately use a contentious Desi example. When television tells you about a gruesome event like the murder of Graham Staines, it brings home the horror of what happened as no other medium can. It sickens you, it tugs at your emotions, it stabs at your conscience, and all of that is very welcome. But what television does not do is to explain why this happened. I don't mean who did it, how, where, when, and at what time. Those facts are easily communicated. I mean, why? How could followers of one of the world's most peaceful religions turn upon a single man and his two children? How could we, a people who think of ourselves as tolerant, welcoming, loving, kill so ruthlessly and mercilessly? Those are questions of context, of background, of history. In the Graham Staines case, they were answered, if at all they were, by a judicial commission. No doubt newspapers don't tackle them adequately either, although in the op-ed pages they try. But then newspapers don't make the same impact when they report such tragedies. Television does. Worse, that impact pushes people towards easy conclusions. A rush to judgment follows. Two consequences stand out. We all think we know the truth behind Graham Stain's grisly death and the guilty party feels hard done by. It. But the truth is embedded in a context television does not and did not explore, and therefore most of us have not found out about. And the guilty party may well be guilty, but we have not as yet fully understood its guilt. This is why there is a bias against understanding inherent, particularly when television has to handle complex, complicated, not easy to explain stories where the context is so critical to understanding what has happened. Let me at this point pause and sum up. Inadequate appreciation of the limitations of television and its inherent tendency to sensationalize, coupled with the fact that news on television is both more frequent and accessible and often has greater impact, can lead to unintended distortions or imperfect understanding. In such circumstances, news and views become perilously mixed up. Now, so far, I've spoken of problems intrinsic to the nature of television. Alas, in India, we also have a few that are a result of how we use this medium. I shall now turn to faults that lie not in our stars, but in ourselves. 
As someone who has spent over 35 years in television, I'm particularly perturbed by four trends I've repeatedly noticed in the last few years. After a recent break from television, I feel a moral compunction to speak up. Not to do so would to let down the profession I love. First, there's the way anchors choose to interview the prime minister. It's done with obvious deference, which leaves little opportunity to challenge or even cross question. Instead of focusing on well-researched subjects which are then pursued with diligence, each question changes the issue. There's no follow-up. Consequently, a multitude of subjects are raised without any meaningful achievement. Equally importantly, the prime minister is permitted to answer at exorbitant length, often rambling and frequently changing the subject and getting away with it. And let me be honest, even Donald Trump has never been interviewed in this way. Worse still is the character of the questions put to the prime minister. Not only are awkward issues avoided, but the questions are emolliently phrased and very gently asked. Instead of bringing up lapses, sorry, instead of bringing up lapses or misjudgments, the prime minister is instead asked to hold forth on the opposition's alleged errors. At no point is he questioned about things that have gone wrong under his job. The net result is the interview lacks rigor. It feels like an easy ride, and frankly, it's the same, whether you watch it on CNN News 18, on TV, on Times Now, Z, or India Today. A second concern is the way some anchors behave during television discussions. Those guests who represent viewpoints they agree with are treated gently, permitted to speak frequently and at whatever length they want. But woe betide the guest whose views are contrary to the anchors. He or she is treated like a guilty prisoner in the dock. Voices rise, language loses its restraint, and questions are fired relentlessly. The tone is accusatory, and a deliberate attempt is made to shame the person. He or she is frequently interrupted. Indeed, they're given little chance to answer one question before the next is hurled at them. Yet the object of a discussion is to give the audience a chance to hear different viewpoints articulated by different voices. The aim is to explore artfully and forensically and leave the audience both enriched and able to judge for itself. Where fair and even-handed treatment is required, the anchor instead takes sides, and each time he does, he or she exposes his or her prejudice. Frankly, this can only diminish the anchor. You see this sort of discussion most often on Republic TV and Times Now. But there are younger anchors on other channels who have also fallen prey to this practice, presumably because they think it wins audiences and perhaps easy popularity. My third concern is best reflected by MDTV because it seems to be the only English news channel with a credible primetime evening news broadcast. Frequently after the story, the news reader feels an urge to tell the viewer what to think or how to judge its content. Now those remarks by the anchor may be pithy, but they still editorialize. It's the newspaper equivalent of a comment by the editor at the end of every front page story, telling the reader to make something of what he's just read. Frankly, this breaches what I would consider the sanctity of news. The viewer should be told what's happened, not how to judge or what to make of it. The latter 
is an intrusion of the news reader's personal viewpoint, which is always unnecessary and frequently unwelcome. Worse, this ends up treating viewers like children. It's therefore also demeaning because it's infantilizing. NDTV is a channel I respect and have the least complaints about. Yet this is a problem that rankles almost every single evening. And surprise, the channel's editors have allowed it to continue. The grotesquely nationalist hashtags TV channels now concoct to push a story or gather a response is my fourth concern. These hashtags reek of ersatz patriotism. They're like drum beats designed to marshal or dragoon a desired response. They deny you an opportunity to think for yourself. Instead, they seek to corral your thoughts. Worse, they are artless and crude, and in fact, an affront to intelligence. Here's an example, fight for India. Love my flag, proud Indian, terror state Pakistan. And as we used to see, anti-nation JNU. These are crude, immature attempts to play with our emotions. These are signs that we, the viewer, are being treated like children who need to be pushed in a direction, told what to think, and if we're still reluctant, it's actually imposed upon us because these hashtags then condition our response. Finally, the argument that what I've criticized, and this is an argument that's frequently made, the argument that what I've criticized is in fact an illustration of new age journalism carries no conviction with me. I may be old fashioned, but even if a story is presented may alter with time and technology, its quest for the truth has to be unchanging. No matter how a story is delivered, good journalism, if it's there, will stand out. Bad journalism, on the other hand, cannot be disguised, leave aside, forgiven by self-serving excuses about the mood of the people or the atmosphere of our time. And certainly, no attempt to make journalism popular justifies lowering standards of objectivity or the critical requirement of fair play. Ultimately, this is more than just about news channels. Indeed, it even goes further than our democracy. It's about us and how we receive the unvarnished truth. If we tolerate half-truths and misrepresentations, we have only ourselves to blame. Most of the people I know believe the media frequently gives them half-truths and misrepresentations. And this brings me to the question, what would the greats of Indian journalism, the Frank Moraes, the Giriral Jens, the Prem Bhatias, the George Verghese's, the Kuldeep Nayars have made of Indian journalism today. Would they applaud their successes or would they cringe with despair? Would they feel the flower has brightened and blossomed or would they sense that it's starting to shrivel up and even rot? The answer lies perhaps in two great changes that have occurred since the 60s, 70s, and 80s, which are the decades when Moraes, Jain, Bhartia, Varghese, and Nair were the doyans of journalism. First, the reputation the media once enjoyed for reliability, balance, and accuracy has grievously suffered. Today, you often hear the put down just because it's in a newspaper on or in television doesn't mean it's true. Social media may have spawned fake news, but the fact people rely on Twitter or WhatsApp or Facebook to find out what's happened suggests they no longer trust a paper or news channel to tell them the truth 
or the full story. Connected to this is the claim the media could once make of being objective and fair. Few people are prepared to believe that today. Without double checking or giving a person a right to reply, and often without knowing the full story, the media judges individuals and finds fault with them. I don't deny there are occasions when we are right, but every time we are wrong, we condemn an innocent person and leave him with little opportunity to correct the prejudiced image we've created. The truth is, whenever, sorry, the truth is whatever you make of the promise of Ache Din, these are not good times for the Indian media. Most people I know have formed an irrevocable impression that the Indian media has become pusillanimous, where once newspapers and television channels boasted of challenging and exposing the government, we now flinch from doing so. Worse, when our voices are raised, it's against the government's opponents and critics, particularly those who have the gall to question the prime minister or the army chief. Instead of watchdogs that should growl at the authorities, even if occasionally mistakenly, the media behaves like guard dogs who want to protect or pet dogs who just want to be liked. The saddest part of all of this is that it's the electronic media of which I'm a part, which is widely thought to be the most to blame. Whether it's our interviews with the prime minister, where we refuse to challenge and sometimes even to seriously question, or our panel discussions, where volume and heat is deliberately preferred to substance and light, or the crude hashtags we deploy on screen which are like drum beats designed to marshal or dragoon a desired response. The net result is we fail to speak truth to power, but also we treat viewers like dumb animals who cannot see through the tricks and will not demand better. We've even reached the stage where the Chief Justice of India in open court has had to admonish the electronic media. And instead of standing up in our defense, newspaper editorials have agreed with him. This is what the business standard had to say last year. There is little doubt that the abandonment of fact checking and of even a pretense to fairness by the electronic media have put into jeopardy not just freedom of speech, but also the smooth working of democracy itself. Of course, television as we know it today did not exist when Murez, Jain, Verghese, Bhatia, and Nayar presided over Bahadur Shah Zafar Mahal. In their time, Durdashan was the plaything of our rulers and rightly revived. Today, as I said, we have nearly 400 independent news channels and they might perhaps be flabbergasted at the sheer number. But if they were to ask, if those five great journalists of the past were to ask a simple question, I wonder how many channels would stand up to that critical test. Is there a channel India can be truly proud of just as the British are justifiably proud of the BBC or the Americans of CNN. I'm really not sure what their answer would be. And to be honest, I'm even scared to find out yours. But let me share my own. There are some channels I'm proud of some of the time. Some programs I'm proud of most of the time. But there are also a few channels and programs that make me cringe all the time. Whilst there are newspapers that I would unreservedly applaud, I'm afraid there isn't a single channel I can say that of without biting my tongue 
because I know I'm fit. But this is not the hopeless situation it might seem. I know I've painted a pretty black picture, but there is the possibility of sunshine breaking through into this darkness. After all, the media changes every day. Each edition of a newspaper and each bulletin of a news channel is a chance to begin afresh. A new reporter, a different anchor, a better editor, and everything could change very quickly. Perhaps more than any other profession, journalism can draw hope from the fact Tomorrow is another day. So what's the solution? I promised hesitant answers and hesitantly I shall attempt them. The first lesson is that reportage is not enough. We need more context, more explanation, more background. In turn, that means we need more specialist correspondence, more correspondence with dedicated fields to furrow and fewer firefighters. It also means that for most important developments, television news needs to supplement reports of what's happened with analysis of why and what it means. In other words, news analysis has to become part of news reportage. The second lesson is that we need more current affairs. News on its own is not enough. We need programs that go deeper, wider, further. I know that in India, at least in theory, we have them, but they fail to serve their purpose. And I include my own in that judgment unreservedly. Such programs work. Such current affairs programs work when they take their subject more seriously than the personalities participating in them. In India, it's the other way around. We need the cold analysis of current affairs. Instead, we have the spectacle and tamasha of clashing viewpoints. We need to shed light, but we end up generating heat. Finally, television needs the sort of wisdom that comes with age. It has in plenty enthusiasm, dedication, tireless striving, and ceaseless vigil. All of that is remarkable in an industry so young. Let that not be gainsaid. But it does not have the capacity to reflect, to pronounce wisely, to be sagacious, to speak with gravitas. No doubt such qualities are difficult to acquire, but their absence is telling. Of course, there's a lot more that can be and should be done, but my intention this evening is to raise questions, focus attention, and hopefully start a debate. For that purpose, I think I've said enough. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, sir, for that very incisive talk, mm -hmm. brutally unsparing and bearing that intrinsic Karan Thapar stamp. Um, we will now proceed to a brief Q&A session. This will be moderated by Dr. Ruchi Jaggi, Director, SIMC. Ruchi, over to you. I'd, uh, before that, I'd also like to request the PIC members, if you uh, would like to pose any questions, to please inbox them directly to uh, Kiran Pardesi. Ruchi. Thanks. Over. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you so much, Mr. Thapar. I think uh, Lisa said it so well. It was the signature Karan Thapar style uh, that uh, we witnessed live today. And thank you for inspiring this young generation of media students who are now today a significant audience for this lecture, because the kind of questions that I've received from them 
uh, actually, I think a lot of answers were inherent in the lecture that you delivered. But I think um, it's an opportunity for them to interact with you directly. And I shall not take more time and deny them this, this uh, opportunity. And hence, I will call out Shraddha Tiwari, uh, one of our students from the Postgraduate Journalism Program, Symbiosis Institute of Media and Communication. Shraddha, would you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Um, so I had uh, two questions. I'll just go with the first one. Um, I wanted to ask you, sir, has the digital age made any kind of significant change in the journalistic style of interviews that we see now, uh, given that the audience attention span has uh, decreased, has become acutely low over digital? So that's the question. Let me give you an honest answer. I personally, and I'm only speaking for myself, really don't care about the audience's attention span. I come from an age, two generations ago, the 80s and 90s when I learned television, that I believe that there is a moral duty on journalists, on television and newspapers to tell people what they need to know, not what they want to know. Unfortunately, the chase for TRPs means the channels now give you what you want to know. Cricket, Bollywood, Hindu, Muslim animosity, and perhaps a certain amount of low-grade pornography. They don't give you what you ought to know. But to give people what they ought to know, you have to assume that there are enough people there willing to concentrate and understand, willing to stretch their minds to grapple with issues that they may not be familiar with, but when explained properly, will understand. And of course, there is a huge duty on journalists to simplify complicated, difficult to understand stories without making them simplistic. There's a big difference between simplifying and making it simplistic. Unfortunately, to do that, journalists need to know the stories themselves. They need to understand it. Most of the time when people are interviewing and I won't name anchors, they're not fully aware of and they haven't fully understood the question, they're the issue they're raising questions about, which is why their questions themselves are ill-informed, which is why they don't communicate the gra gravity of what they are handling, which is why audiences get bored and switch off. So my answer to your question is, if a journalist handles the issue properly because he knows it, simplifies it without making it simplistic, conveys the importance of the issue, audiences will listen. But remember, at the end of the day, current affairs and news is not entertainment. And that's another mistake made in India. When you chase ratings, you treat the audience as if they are being entertained and you give them what is entertaining. No, news and current affairs is for those who care to know and will make the effort to know and will make the time to listen. And if they aren't in a mood to do so, let them switch and watch Z News, or not Z News, sorry, Star and some other channel. So the answer is, don't worry too much about concentration spans and worry instead about communicating adequately, making simple things that are difficult and putting in your own homework to be able to do that. Thank you, Thank you so much, Mr. Thapar, for very, very nuanced and very direct way of putting the difference between need to know and want to know in terms of audiences. Before I take on the next two student question, sir, I have, I have a question from one of our audience members from Mr. Madhukar Kotwal, who asks you that since you have been so frank in mentioning a few channels, would you give your opinion on Al Jazeera and beyond and their journalism? I would have been happy to do so if I was a frequent viewer of Al Jazeera, but I'm not. I watch Al Jazeera perhaps for a total of two minutes a month. And on that basis, I don't think I'm in a position to have an opinion of the channel. I probably don't even have a memory of what I watch. It is so infrequent. However, if the gentleman wants to give my opinion of the BBC, I know he didn't ask about that, but if he does, I'd be happy to do so. Uh, sure. We, we, we certainly, I think as an audience, would like to understand your opinion of the BBC, sir. Then let me give it in a nutshell. It is by far the best channel in the world. And I'll repeat that. By far the best channel in the world. And I'll tell you why I say it. 
because it is not in a race to be first, it prefers to be accurate. Mm. It is not simply in the business of telling you what's happened. It's equally concerned about explaining why, and more importantly, what this means. Which is why you will notice that frequently BBC News has reporters talking to the anchor in very brief two minute accounts to explain the significance of what they've just reported on. This is what I meant when I said news analysis has to become a part of news reportage. The anchor will tell you what's happened. There'll be a bit of footage to show it and then he or she will cut to the concerned correspondent, be it the health correspondent in London or the foreign correspondent in Jerusalem to quickly tell you the significance, the meaning, what it means for the government. And that is done, by the way, in two minutes. It's not a discussion of five minutes. And that means that it's structured. It also means that the correspondent on the other end has thought through the answer. Watch in comparison our correspondents or our news reporters when they're actually asked by the anchor to explain something. The answers are, forgive me, I'm being very brutally honest, littered with ums and ahs and gaps and pauses, which clearly suggests that they're thinking as they're talking, they haven't done the thinking in advance. And then they repeat themselves, not once, but two or three times, which also suggests that they're not sure what to say, it is easy to fall back on a repetition. And you end up saying to yourself, well, I'm not sure I've learned very much from that, but certainly the enthusiasm of the person concerned has been conveyed and the freshness of his vitality or her vitality has been conveyed, but that's not what you want on a news channel. You want understanding. You want authoritative communication of news so that you can believe it. But if the reporter speaking to you, himself or herself is nervous and unsure and speaks with ums and ahs, then you don't have much confidence in what you're hearing. It's a normal human reaction. None of those are problems on the BBC. And by the way, the BBC has some very good some very, very good discussion and interview program where they are pretty firm, but always polite. And that's another thing. And I'll be honest, I don't think I always manage it. So I criticize myself here as much as I criticize anyone else. There is a wonderful talent the BBC has of being firm and persistent, but polite. And even when they interrupt, which they do, and there's nothing wrong in interrupting, particularly if the other person is deliberately evading or avoiding, they do it politely, but firmly with a quick apology and then they carry on. Those are little things that make it easier for audiences to accept what's happening. And at the end of the day, you must remember when you're doing an interview that if you don't carry the audience with you, what's the point of the interview? You must, you must at least leave the audience feeling, they may not like the line you're pursuing, but your objective, your fair, your balance. You don't have an ax of your own to grind. The second the audience thinks, this guy's got an ax. This guy doesn't like the other person. That's why he's doing it. The interview loses credibility. So your objectivity, your balance is critical and must be maintained only by you. No one else will maintain it. That's again something. Watch the BBC. They meticulously do. Thank you for thank you for that very insightful response. Uh, in fact, uh, there are a couple of questions, so I'll call out a, I'll call out Vidya Bhushan Arya, her one of our professors at the undergraduate media school. Uh, uh, Professor Vidya Bhushan, if you're online, would you unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Okay. Uh, all right. I think there must be some connectivity issue there. Instead, can I please ask then? Uh, Anirudh uh, from the Symbiosis Institute of Media and Communication. Okay, I see Professor Vidya Bhushan. Sorry, uh, would you please unmute yourself and ask your question? And if there's a problem, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Uh, go ahead. Good evening, sir. Uh, sir, now it is a cliche to say that media is a fourth pillar of democracy because we see that fourth pillar is crumbling, really. Uh, how long this uh, phase will continue? And uh, because there are some channels uh, who are actually willing to question the government, but they are unable as they feel that there is some undeclared uh, uh, you know, air of uh, emergency. So uh, how long it will continue and when media will be really free to ask question or to question the government or the ideology that is in power? It's a fascinating question, Professor. 
And I think of it in two parts. First, you asked how long will the crumbling of the media continue until it completely crumbles and falls apart is the sad answer. And there are some channels and some newspapers that are determined to crumble to dust. Uh, and, I, and they're doing it very effectively. And I suspect pretty speedily, they will be reduced to dust, not in a physical sense, but in the sense in which we think of them. Their credibility would have been reduced to zero. On the other hand, yes, you're right. There are some channels that are determined to continue questioning the government, which is their job and duty to do. NDTV is a prime example of such a channel. Journalists on NDTV like Sir Keto Padhyay, Srinivas and Jain are wonderful examples of how this can be done. The problem is that we have in the Modi government for the first time, a government that deliberately boycotts and avoids being questioned. There are a whole series of journalists that Mr. Modi and Mr. Modi's government and Mr. Modi's party has boycotted, literally boycotted. They will not appear on their programs. They will not talk to them. Uh, they have nothing to do with them. Uh, and that is a very effective way of neutering the media. Because remember, on television, if you can't speak to someone, you can't interview them, if you have panel discussions and the government is not present in any shape or form, then that becomes an unbalanced discussion. And if you therefore deliberately follow a policy of boycotting channels or boycotting certain anchors, the government has found another way of effectively silencing them. So these channels, NDTV in particular, have to frequently find proxies for the government, proxies for the BJP, people who are presented as supporters of but not actually necessarily members of. That's a second hand and indirect way of finding someone to represent the government, but it's not the most effective. And this is terribly sad because if you think of it, even President Trump who makes no secret of how much he hates the media is still available to be interviewed by CNN, the Washington Post, the New York Times, because he accepts and realizes that at the end of the day in a democracy, Politicians have to be accountable. It's their duty to answer questions. And if those questions are asked toughly, to put up with it. And they do. It's only in our country that politicians carry out a policy of deliberately avoiding. And let's be honest, it's not just the Modi government that does it. Dr. Manmohan Singh, for 10 years our prime minister, did not make himself available to be interviewed. And this raises a fundamental concern that goes way beyond the media as the fourth pillar. It's a concern with the quality of our democracy. And frankly, it's a concern with the caliber and character of our politicians. A democracy is not just voting on voting day. That's just the technical aspect of democracy. A democracy is holding power to account, being transparent, explaining to the people who voted you in. Communication is at the heart of democracy. And that means you ask a question, you get the answer. But if the government is not available to answer, then that accountability is never happening. That responsibility to people who voted you into power to explain to them, to communicate to them is not being fulfilled. And that is where Indian democracy becomes hollow. And I use that word deliberately. And think of the issues that have torn our country apart in just the last six months. The National Register of Citizens, Article 370, the Citizenship Amendment Act. On any of them, was our government available to answer questions? And you know the answer. Yes. And should it not have been? Can you imagine a Boris Johnson bumbling and mophead like as he may be? or a Donald Trump, offensive and orange faced as he may be, actually refusing to answer questions on these issues if they'd arisen in their country? It's impossible to believe. And that is, by the way, the essence of a true democracy. When politicians, even in the depths of their unpopularity, knowing that they will not be treated what they consider fairly, are still available. That's the big difference between a Western democracy and ours. We vote, we throw governments out. But once the government's elected, 
it becomes our lord and master thank you thank you thank you so much sir and absolutely because you were talking a little bit about the ca there were there are a few questions in the chat box directed to me and a couple of student questions also and i'll just split the larger question into two parts there is one question about your opinion on how news media covered the entire issue around caa and there is a student question from a school of media and communication the po a postgraduate student akanksha who asks about how deliberately the mainstream electronic media ignored assam from the conversations around caa so there are two different questions but i've just got them together and seek your uh, response on that thank you i think my memory of the coverage of the citizenship amendment act protest is somewhat distanced by the fact that for the last 8 months it's been so comprehensively overtaken by our concern for covid the collapsing economy and in the last 4 or 5 months the trouble on the border of ladakh with china so my recall of the coverage in december and the early parts of january may not be as perfect and immediate as it otherwise should be but by and large several news channels did cover the ca protest very adequately and fully whether they asked all the questions that should be is another issue but i think what did come across was two things one that the people who were protesting were not just muslims who felt aggrieved but a very large section of the rest of india and many of them were young and they were doing so wrapping themselves in the flag holding the constitution and they did so by the way very cleverly because they did not allow themselves to be portrayed by the bjp as anti national and by the way just because you're protesting against the government doesn't mean you're anti national at all you have a right to protest it's just that the bjp portrays you as anti national but in this instance the young people protesting ensured that bjp put the second thing that came across was the manner in which the authorities and the police in particular and that has since grown were very one sided and partial in the treatment of what the bjp said versus what the protesters said do you remember those blood curdling slogans and calls and speeches by people like anurag thakur goli maro salon ko even to this day there is no police action against them or against kapil mishra who standing beside a deputy police commissioner literally standing beside him threatened the police and threatened violence no action against any of them but all of that was brought out by the media i think i think and i think i am fairly certain now in my opinion that the media did cover those protests very adequately I think what we didn't get is a sense of deeper perspective, but maybe it was difficult because it was so immediate and happening around us. But one or two interviews with some more thoughtful, reflective people about the CEA, from both the point of view of people who believed it was the right thing to do, as well as those who believed it was the right th wrong thing to do, would have helped us understand and reflect upon. the deeper issues but then you know when there's a series of high volatile protests happening the deeper issues do get pushed to the background and sometimes don't get taken up um but it would have been nice for one or two of the discussion programs to have deliberately and consciously done that right. instead of what happened was when discussion programs were supposed to happen they usually happen at 10 at night because the protests were still happening you would cut live to that and you'd have endless reporters going around asking people about the cold and what they feel you know they were repeating what they done for the last 6 days in the canada you need it occasionally to pull back and go deeper that didn't happen you know so the same point that you made about like deeper news analysis which sort of now looks like a vacuum in tv tv news in particular now i'll just ask the next student from symbiosis institute of media and communication anirudh to ask his question Anirudh if you are online could you please unmute yourself and ask your question
Okay, Anirudh, if it's taking time, I also have a few questions coming from, from the audience on the chat box, sir, then I'll just read that. One of the questions that, um, um, you know, I, I, I think there are a couple of people who've written the same thing, that they strongly feel that the younger people in particular do not watch TV news. And in this scenario, uh, how would you look at the future of television news as a seasoned TV journalist? But there's no doubt that, in fact, young people don't watch TV news, but they've also perhaps even earlier given up reading the papers. And social media or the internet or the information you get on your phone is what gives them the information they believe they need. In a sense, this is a reflection, as I mentioned in my uh, speech, on the diminishing quality of the media and people no longer believing that it's objective, that it's credible, that it tells the full story, that it tells it fairly. But equally, it is also a reflection of the fact that we are in an age where the young do not believe that a, the sort of understanding of news and, and international events that an elder generation thought was important is important. The, my generation, your generation, grew up believing that it was critical to know, to understand, to reflect upon. Perhaps, and I don't mean to be critical, I'm just being descriptive, today's young live in the here and now and don't worry so much about the bigger context, the greater question. Some do, I'm not saying they don't, but there is so much else happening around them that the here and now fulfills them and satisfies them. Um, and, if, if that is how the future is to develop, I personally would be sad because our understanding of the world in which we live, the questions that we ask, the answers that we seek are part of the progress, I would say a critical requirement of the progress we've made. But if those questions are no longer asked, those answers are no longer sought, that context is no longer deemed important, then we could become very different people in a different world. I'm just sharing a few hesitant, half-formed thoughts. This is not any great reflection. Yes, uh, but but it is a reflection indeed and poignant uh, in so many ways. Uh, uh, so may I like now request Pranjal Koshali, one of our students, to ask her question. Pranjal, are you online? And could you please ask your question? Hello. Hello, Pranjal, please go ahead. Ask your question. Yeah. Hello, sir. A very good evening and thank you for such an insightful session. Uh, you mentioned in your session that when it comes to political reporting, many prominent news media outlets and anchors seem to be biased towards one point of view or the other. They take positions either as proponents or harsh critics of certain uh, political parties and carry this bias in every aspect of reporting. So I wanted to inquire, how do we as members of the audience hold these institutions accountable to make certain that they would focus only on fair reporting and do not try to push their agenda or any political agenda forward? Well, there's a very simple answer that you and I as viewers can opt for. And then there's another answer that advertisers have the power to fulfill. The simple answer for you and me is, if you don't think the channel is doing a good job, don't watch it. There's absolutely no compulsion to switch on Times Now. If you really think Times Now is appalling in its coverage or Republic is appalling in its coverage, then put your money where your mouth is and switch off and don't watch. But it's a bit hypocritical to say it's an appalling channel. I disagree with everything they do. I think they don't have any standards. Think their journalism is horrible. And yet keep watching it because somehow you're hooked to the Tamasha they put on stage. Frankly, that's hypocrisy. So if you really don't like and don't approve of something, don't watch. And if enough people don't watch, the channel will get the message very quickly. And then there's the power of advertisers. There are a lot of companies, few of them speak out in public, but two recently have. Rajiv Bajaj, he lives in Pune near you, and Pale. Both have publicly said that they will not continue to pay and fund the hate that is promoted on channels like Times Now and Republic and they've withdrawn their advertising. And if enough commercial houses and industrial houses feel the same, I don't know if they do. I'm simply putting that question. If enough feel the same, 
and withdraw that advertising, it will again put huge, almost irresistible pressure on these channels to change. But if instead you say to yourself, as an industrialist, as a maker of biscuits or scooters or cars or whatever, I want the maximum number of eyeballs, then you are in fact providing the capacity to these channels to go lower and lower in standards to attract a bigger and bigger audience. And let's face it, in our country, anti-Muslim hate speech sells. It's one of the saddest reflections on us, and let's face it as people, we watch it. So in the end, we have ourselves to blame. We watch this horrible stuff because lurking in us is that anti-Muslim sentiment. We watch it, we can't complain about it unless we also are prepared to complain about ourselves. The fault, I'm afraid, eventually, finally lies in ourselves. Uh, one question that's come from one of our audience members, one of the members of PIC, um, it's Mr. Uh, Madhukar Kotwal, sir, is, what are your specific suggestions on dealing with the flood of fake news which has become so threatening? Well, most of the fake news, I believe, circulates on social media, and I'm not on social media. I'm not on Twitter, I'm not on Facebook, I'm not on Instagram, I'm not on any of them. Uh, that's partly because I'm technically incompetent. I barely know how to handle my own smartphone. I can't handle a computer. So one benefit of my utter incompetence is I'm not capable of being on social media. And as a result, the flood of fake news that comes through social media, I don't get. But there is also now the emergence of a certain amount of Maybe fake news is too strong, but unverified, unchecked, uncorroborated news that also comes through on television and also comes through on papers. I get a lot of my information for my programs from newspapers, and I read four or five or six newspapers on the same story. And one of the things I've discovered, not just recently, but for years, is that even when the same press conference is being reported, what someone said differs, sometimes interestingly, sometimes critically, in different papers. And yet all their reporters are there listening to the same person and he's only said it once. But the way they've reported it in quotation marks is different. Just watch it. Read any press conference report in four different papers and you'll suddenly say to yourself, very interesting difference. The same sentence comes up, but it's different in four different papers. That's because there's a certain laziness in the way it's being reported. Right. And that allows for uncorroborated news too. You frequently find little references that are just wrong, inaccurate. The, the date is wrong or someone is referred to as something that they were, which they aren't. And no one really bothers because it's just considered okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Lisa Pingale, who was moderating the session earlier, has a question. Uh, Lisa, please go ahead. Yeah, I, um, Mr. Thapar, I wanted to ask you about the ethics in journalism. And you feel that we, uh, the ethics in journalism are no longer as strong as they used to be, and that journalists have either given into fear or pressure or even maybe TRPs because uh, uh, mo most, uh, a lot of uh, channels, TV channels have now become business houses as opposed to uh, source of information or journalism even. Yeah, and do you, or do you also feel that this polarization is more uh, prominent in the past uh, few years? I think everything I've said in my speech makes clear that the journalists are not as independent as they used to be, whether the pressure is one that an individual journalist feels himself and therefore he's repressing himself or whether it's pressure from their proprietors or whether it's pressure from the government. But certainly the uh, capacity, the willingness, the strength and the courage of newspapers and television channels to stand up and be defiant, to speak out and be bold has diminished. However, when you talk about ethics, there are two other aspects that I'd like to pick up on because the second half of your question would have me simply repeating what I've said in the speech, so I won't do that because everyone's heard it. But, you know, there is some... Journalism, by definition, is an ethical profession because what you're doing is that you believe it's important to inform, 
You believe theoretically that objectivity and balance is critical. You believe that in fact, giving people the opportunity of questioning them to enforce their transparency is important. Those are all ethical positions. There is a certain ethical foundation, an ethical basis, an ethical attitude that drives a person to want to be a journalist. That is fundamentally part of it. And I'm, I'm sure the same ethical foundation lies under many other professions as well. So I'm not saying that journalism is unique, but it's particularly to the fore if you look at journalism in terms of the issues that I've just identified a moment ago. However, there is another aspect of journalism, which is the technical aspect, where the ethics of good reporting are not observed. Accuracy, giving people a chance to respond, right? Double checking your facts. Those are all technical qualities which are part of the craft of journalism that means that you are good at your job in a technical sense. Those aren't always fulfilled, which is why often news reports are unbalanced. Often an attempt is not made to double check whether someone actually did this or actually said it. Language is often used, not just carelessly, but without realizing what it's doing. People are usually called criminals. A classic example is we refer to MPs who face FIRs as criminal MPs. Actually, they're not. You're only a criminal when you're found guilty by a court. Till such time, you are not a criminal. And this is not just a pretty technical distinction. It's a very important one. Journalists should call them accused. That's a different phrase. Or alleged. You know, those words like reportedly, allegedly, supposedly, are very important terms because to those who understand their meaning, they actually convey the fact that this is not confirmed. It's only reported. But those words are missing in our use of language. Therefore, the point I'm making is there is an ethical foundation to the very character and basis of journalism, but in the way in which the craft is deployed, in the technical qualities that would determine good or bad journalism, those ethical concerns of accuracy, balance, fair play, using the language properly yeah. to convey the right meaning rather than a false or unjustified meaning, those aren't paid any heed to at all. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there, there are a couple of students who haven't been able to unmute themselves because of some technical issues. So please uh, allow me to read out their questions. I'm going to combine a couple of questions, sir. Uh, I think there are two or three questions which I'll just get together. One is one student in particular has asked that if you were to look at all the interviews that you have done so far in retrospect, is there any interview you think you might would you would you would want to do differently. And then of course, uh, there are repeated references to your interview with Mr. Modi. And so many audience members are invoking me to ask you about that. And then of course, there is one question, which is more of a dilemma from a younger student of ours, Anirudh, who says that, you know, in this world of binaries, as a, as a younger person, sometimes it's very difficult for, for um, for someone like him uh, uh, to make his parents or grandparents see the motives and not fall into binaries and also look at the other side of the narrative uh, when especially they're watching TV news. So uh, it's, it's sort of a conflict that a lot of young people who feel that they are critically more media literate, they feel and they sometimes don't know how to address it even with their families. So just getting all this together and posing, posing the entire thing to you, sir. Let me combine two of your questions into one. You said there's a lot of curiosity about the interview I did with Mr. Modi, which I believe lasted for two minutes and 40 seconds. And also the first question, are there interviews that I would have handled differently in retrospect? And certainly the Modi interview is one that I would have handled differently in retrospect. Jocularly speaking, you'll recall that at the end of those two minutes, 40 seconds, Mr. Modi ended the interview by saying, Mene pani pina. And I thought that he simply wanted to quench his thirst, but in fact, Pani Pina was his excuse of ending the interview. So if I were to interview him again, I would start by saying, Agar aapko lagi hai, to, pani pehle pili jaya, uh, to ensure that he didn't have an opportunity to have water in the middle. But speaking more seriously, 
I would have tried to find a way to ensure that Mr. Modi stayed for longer. I have no regret about the question that I asked, which got him to get up and leave, because I think it was perfectly justified. But perhaps on reflection, I would have put it in towards the end so that we had 20 minutes already in the bag. And if he wanted to get up and walk out, he'd have got up and walked out in the last two minutes when frankly, it wouldn't have mattered so much. But I'll tell you what that question was and I'll tell you why I think it was still the right question to ask, even if it was deliberately, and I say that myself, deliberately designed to be provocative. It was perhaps the very first interview question. It said, Mr. Modi, India Today magazine and the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation think of you as the best chief minister in the country. On the other hand, 140 million Muslims look upon you as a mass murderer. Six weeks away from your second election, do you have an image problem? And the phrase that was deliberately designed to be provocative is that phrase mass murderer. And I thought about it very carefully. Should I use it or should I not? I said, I'm well aware that I'm using a phrase that he will not like. It will undoubtedly provoke him. It will upset him. He will think it is crude. He will probably think it is rude. I said, on the other hand, if I were to speak to those 140 million Muslims, that is precisely the word they would use. There was no hiding the fact that that's how they thought about him. And they said that in their conversations. So I said, what I'm doing when I ask this question is to put to a politician the truth of what people think of him. If I deliberately use a euphemism, then I'm not conveying the strength of the feeling those Muslims have. And therefore, he's not getting to know what they actually think. And I'm not being honest either. Many of the Muslims watching me would have said, oh, hang on, we wouldn't be half as polite as that. Have you, do you not have the guts to say to him what we actually think of him? So I said, fine. Honesty requires that I convey to him the strength of feeling of those Muslims by using that phrase. And frankly, he's a politician. He's elected to face up to it, not to hide behind polite language. And so I said, I will put that word because that's what they feel. Um, and frankly, if I did the interview again, I'd have phrased the question identically. The only thing I'd have done, knowing now with hindsight that he was going to get up and walk out, is that I would have left it to the end rather than the beginning. But why did I put it at the beginning? Because again, at the time, 13 years ago, I said, Mr. Modi undoubtedly will believe this is going to come up as an issue. How can he not? We are in 2007, five years away from Godra and Gujarat. Secondly, he's poised for his second re-election. There's a lot to talk to him about, but this is an issue that must be brought up as well. This issue can't dominate the interview. It mustn't dominate the interview, but it can't be avoided and ignored either. So I said the honest thing to do is bring it up at the beginning. If I don't bring it up at the beginning, it will hang like a sword of Democles over the interview because Mr. Modi will be saying to himself, and when is this going to come up? When is this going to come up? And that would have made him defensive. It would have distracted him. So I said, the honest thing to do is bring it up at the beginning, spend two or three minutes on it, get it out of the way, and then go on to all the other important issues that there are there. But now with hindsight, Perhaps instead of doing what I thought was the honest thing, bring it up at the beginning and get it out of the way. Don't let it hang like a sword of Democles. I would have done what is perhaps the crafty thing. And I'm using that word purposely, the crafty, the clever thing, which is not bring it up for 20 minutes so that I've got 20 minutes in the bag and then bring it up knowing that he's going to walk up. <laughs> As, as always, that was a very, very direct, honest, and scathing answer. And uh, thank you for being so direct about it once again. And um, uh, Lisa, are we out of time? Can we take one or two more questions? I suspect we're very close out of time. It's 6.35. OK, all right, all maybe, right. Maybe your all audience right. is tired and gone away, which is why they won't <laughs> unmute themselves. No, no, that, no, that's very unlikely, sir. But uh, yeah. I think I think we should end with this, uh, Ruchi, if you can yes. propose the Yes, yes, yes. And uh, I'm very 
honored to uh, have been uh, to be having this opportunity to propose the word of thanks you know as somebody uh, who has the opportunity to lead the journalism school at symbiosis which is a 30 year old journalism school where we also had the good fortune of having someone like dr dilip patkankar as our rk lakshman chair professor whose association with symbiosis is something that our chancellor dr sb mujumdar spoke about earlier i think for us today your talk mr thapar was not just a lesson in what genuine journalism has should be about but also i think a lecture in media laws and ethics that we constantly discuss in classes but i don't know where it goes outside classes you know while one of our audience members also spoke about the younger generations resistance today to be audiences to tv news i will put it on record that for the last couple of years we've also been finding a very low interest from our students in terms of joining tv news channels as reporters they try to look for alternative opportunities but most of them don't want to get into tv news which is something that bothers and disturbs us because if they won't get into tv news then who's going to change the face of news as you very rightly uh, in your talk also talked about that no no more true than in journalism that every day is a new day that optimistic note on which which you close your speech so i would now like to formally propose the vote of thanks uh, mr thapar i am so thankful uh, to you Uh, uh mr thapar for having accepted this invite to deliver the fourth uh, dilip pitgaonkar memorial lecture thank you for raising all those questions both structural as well as at a very very cold elemental level where you spoke about what sort of news do we get from tv you also threw light on how tv inherently has a tendency to sensationalize and therefore it is very important to wisely handle uh, uh, uh this through balanced commentaries thank you for bringing to the fora uh, the discussion on the limitations of tv news which are very difficult to ta tackle especially problems of what cannot be shown what cannot be displayed and what cannot be filmed and therefore how that tends to get oversimplified when you said and quoted a seasoned journalist on tv has a bias against understanding it couldn't be truer and i think tv really needs to introspect and look at that you brought focus on unintended distortions when news and views overlap and in the context of what we see as fake news today that is something that was a very significant insight coming from you you threw light in your lecture on contemporary trends and issues including the quality of anchors interviews the sanctity of news but i think you also also brought forth a very poignant but hard hitting uh, trend called infantilization of viewers which was extremely in a, in in many ways uh, the reality that we are living with you also reflected on each one of us as our role not just as viewers as citizens thank you for also tracing the trajectory of journalism through the 1960s 70s and 80s and talking about the exponents of journalism who looked at the craft of journalism in very very different ways you asked a very tough question that which tv news channels would in would india be proud of which tv news channel today would india be proud of and i think that that was a very very strong question uh, because it's very difficult to find an answer to that question in the current context however on an optimistic note when you said that the media changes every day and then shifted your lecture to offering us recommendations and solutions where you said reportage is not enough we require more specialized correspondence more context in news more explanation and deeper analysis you spoke about a focus on current affairs and in answering a lot of questions where you spoke about distinguishing between for a journalist distinguishing between the need to know as the primary driving force as opposed to what the audience wants to know you really unpacked what journalism in general and what tv news in particular should stand for so thank you so much sir uh, for for bringing this level of nuance and and this level of detail uh, to this thank you so much to dr marshall and the team uh, for there starting for the session in such a bright eye and thank, thank you to our it team for supporting the session so seamlessly to all the audience members students of symbiosis faculty from symbiosis international university um, also all the audience members from pune international center and a large of lot of audiences uh, uh, general audiences who joined us also on the live streaming on youtube uh, uh, on this session uh, 
thank you so much to Ms. Latika Padgaonkar uh, for being with us on this session year after year and helping us coordinate it and do it well. And I would just like to say, Mr. Uh, Thapur, to you that uh, I hope that you would be able to come to Symbiosis to our campus and speak to our students directly in the classroom because this motivation, uh, this level of clarity, this level of nuance is something that will push them to look at the vocation of journalism, the profession that they have chosen for themselves uh, with more uh, missionary zeal, with more excitement, uh, with a certain courage that you display, sir, that we want every huge journalist, every journalism aspirant to have. So thank you so much for being a part of the session today. Truly grateful. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure and an honor and privilege to be invited to deliver the fourth the Deep Kadam Karma More Lecture. I thank you for inviting me and thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much.